In this video, we'll look at the one-term presidency of the second president of the United States, John Adams. Uh, Washington decided not to seek a third term, and uh, thus Adams was free to run for the presidency, and he ran against Thomas Jefferson in the election of 1796. You know, uh, this was the first real contested presidential election, and it, it represented the, the growing political factions, the emerging political parties. In the end, John Adams defeated Thomas Jefferson, and you can see by the uh, electoral map here where their relative strengths lay politically. The uh, sort of the, the pink brownish color up top is in the north, that is for Adams, and the green in the back in the frontier in the south, that's for Jefferson. John Adams, on the left here, uh, from Massachusetts, he was an overt Federalist. Uh, he wasn't trying, you know, to be a, as impartial as Washington had been. He had a, an opinion. And uh, Jefferson on the right, as we've already said, was an overt, you know, he was a, overtly identifying with the emerging faction, the emerging party, the Democrat Republicans. But in the election of 1796, however, the Constitution still provided that the individual with the most electoral college votes would become president, and the second place electoral college finisher would become vice president. The, the Constitution didn't anticipate political parties. Now, this meant that the new president, John Adams, had it as, as his, had his you know, chief opponent, Thomas Jefferson, as his vice president. You know, obviously a, a, a problem. Adams had other political challenges, too, including mutual animosity between he and Hamilton. While both were Federalists, Hamilton saw himself as Washington's rightful heir and leader of the emerging Federalist Party. Uh, until Hamilton's famous death, which we'll discuss in a later video, you know, there, there's a lot of competition, a political competition between John Adams and Alexander Hamilton. The war between Britain and France, of course, continued, and... Uh, you know, France, angered by the new president's decidedly pro-British slant, they began seizing American ships like the, the English had done earlier. And there were a number of uh, naval skirmishes that they took place. Uh, and uh, by 1800, the, in fact, the French had seized 300 American ships and broken official diplomatic relations, recalled their ambassador to the United States. This became known as the Quasi-War with France as it unfolded in 1798-1799 during Adams' presidency. To keep uh, the Quasi-War from, you know, growing into a full-fledged declaration of war and all-out warfare, John Adams dispatched three uh, American emissaries to go to Paris to uh, negotiate with the French. And... Uh, he appointed uh, to lead the group Charles Pinckney, who was the brother of Thomas Pinckney, I'd mentioned earlier. And along with Pinckney, uh, John Marshall, who uh, was a Federalist uh, lawyer, and I'm going to talk about him later, and also Elridge Jerry of Massachusetts. And so there are three of them. When the three Americans debarked in France, they were accosted by three agents of French Foreign Minister Talleyrand, who was famous for his political shakedowns. The three French agents told the Americans the French would not negotiate until the Americans paid a bribe. When uh, Adams reported uh, to Congress about the incident, and you can see that report here on the right, he labeled the three French agents X, Y, and Z. And this incident has become known as history as the XYZ affair. The three French agents had demanded a loan of $12 million to France, a bribe of $250,000 to the five French, quote-unquote, citizens that were then leading the country. It was the French uh, Revolution. And uh, they wanted Adams to apologize to France uh, in an address to Congress. Now, you know, I, I don't want you to realize, I mean, bribes were common in 18th century diplomacy. You, you can think of Washington's giving Alexander McGovery his, his demand of $100,000. But the XYZ's demands, France's demands, were only the promise to negotiate. Uh, they're not actually part of the negotiation. 
And so the uh, Pinckney and G Gary and Marshall uh, relayed John Adams' response, which was, no, no, not a sixpence. Uh, when the incident became public with the report, the press created the slogan, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute, unquote. You know, even, even Democratic Republicans were hard-pressed to defend France with, with the XYZ affair, but there was one Democratic Republican named George Logan, who was a Pennsylvania Quaker, and he decided, uh, to, at his own expense, to go to Paris and try to negotiate a peace. And while he did secede in getting some American seamen released, uh, most Americans were angered by his, uh, uh, his apparent pro-French private diplomacy. And uh, the result was in 1799, the Logan Act. And the Logan Act in 1799 uh, forbade private citizens from negotiating with uh, foreign governments without official authorization. It's still uh, in force today. Faced with the possibility of war with France, Adams began to build up the U.S. Navy, constructing three men of war. Those are big battleships and were very expensive and only the powers really had them. They're kind of like aircraft carriers today. But the three that he, uh, they were going to build were the USS Constitution. And this picture here is a, a replica of it shown today. It's not the actual one, but the, a copy made recently. The USS United States and the USS Constellation. By the end of uh, Adams' presidency, the U.S. Navy had 33 ships. Congress uh, also authorized a new army of 10,000 men to serve for three years in case the French decided to invade the United States. They even called ex-president Washington out of retirement to be the commander. Washington agreed, but he was too old to really do much, even if the French did invade. And recruitment went slowly, uh, largely as a result. To pay for the military buildup in possible war, Adams and the Federalist Congress passed the Direct Tax of 1798. Unlike the excise tax passed earlier, a tax on a transaction or activity of uh, goods and services, this tax, uh, the Direct Tax, was direct directly on property. It was a progressive tax on land that went up to 1% of the value of the land. This tax proved incredibly unpopular, and in the western rebellious areas of Pennsylvania, the same areas where there had been the uh, Whiskey Rebellion, a Revolutionary War veteran named John Fry's led the so-called Fry's Rebellion. Uh, Hamilton is going to lead a, a military force to put down the rebellion, like Washington put down the Whiskey Rebellion, and Fries was sentenced to be executed for treason when they caught him. Like Washington pardoning the Whiskey Rebellers, uh, the Adams ended up pardoning Fries, uh, but the Fries Rebellion hurt Adams uh, and the, the Federalist political fortunes in the area. In the war, uh, potential war with France, Adams was lucky because, uh, as I said, Napoleon came to power, and Napoleon was uh, first and foremost concerned with defeating the British uh, in Europe, and so he, uh, he they sort of uh, concentrated on on Europe and, and uh, was not as interested in, in you know, stirring the, uh, the pot with the United States, and they kind of stopped seizing American ships as a result of that. So fortunately for John Adams, uh, one of the things he did do in his in his one-term presidency was he was able to keep us out of war with France because we came to hang on close. In uh, another sense, one of the most significant appointments Adams made, he uh, named the Federalist John Marshall, who had just gone to negotiate uh, with France, part of the uh, that negotiation in the XYZ affair. He appointed John Marshall Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And as noted in subsequent videos, Marshall is going to prove to be one of the most famous, powerful, and long-serving chief justice in the process solidifying the power of the federal government in constitutional precedent, including uh, judicial review. In another sense, Adams faced a, a tough situation politically. 
the Federalists remained strongest in New England and among wealthy merchants. As the United States grew, however, it attracted many poor people from countries such as Ireland, who, you know, they don't have any love of the British, and, and so they favored the French over the British. These poor, poor immigrants, uh, not surprisingly, tended to settle in the South and on the Western frontier, and they, that was Democratic-Republican strongholds, and they tended to vote Democratic-Republicans. The Federalists were worried about this because if it continued, then they would they would never win an election again. So they are going to end up responding by passing a, a series of laws collectively known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. And you can see them here on the right. The Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798 consisted of four measures. The Naturalization Act, the Alien Friends Act, the Alien Enemies Act, and the Sedition Act. The first, the Naturalization Act, increased to 14 years the period of residence required for an immigrant to attain American citizenship, citizenship and thus they attain the right to vote. You had to live in America for 14 years before you could vote. The Alien Friends and the Alien Enemies Act allowed the president to deport any foreigner who he considered dangerous to the country. And there was no, uh, no, no guarantee that he just wouldn't just deport people because they weren't voting uh, the way he wanted them to do. The, uh, the Sedition Act, the last one, made it a crime to publish, uh, publish, quote, false, scandalous, and malicious writings, unquote, against the government or its officials. And, uh, you know, that, of course, is like Pandora's box. What is a false, scandalous, and malicious writing? And it could be considered uh, simply saying uh, something against the president himself. So there were some, uh, there, there were some real questions about this uh, these series of laws. While Adams later claimed in his memoirs that he didn't promote the new laws, he just signed them under pressure from other Federalists. The laws clearly sought to enhance his re-election chances. What happened, however, is that many Americans understandably saw them as a violation of the Constitution. There was at this time no recognized judicial review, the Supreme Court's power to review acts of Congress for their constitutionality. And thus the laws heightened political tensions and, uh, and anger heading into the 1800 election. With no judicial review, the Democratic-Republican-dominated legislatures of Virginia and Kentucky passed resolutions in 1798 and 1799, respectively, often referred to together as uh, the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. They declared that the Alien Sedition Acts did not apply to their states. Now, you know, this is a hugely important idea known as nullification. In nullification, a state can say, hey, man, that, that federal law doesn't apply to us. And it suggested that the states, not the federal governments, were the truly sovereign governments. This question of nullification is going to grow several times in the coming years in 19th century, and it's not really going to be decided ultimately in, until the Civil War. On November 1st, 1800, just before the election of 1800, Adams arrived in the new capital city, Washington, to take up his residence in, the, in what was called the President's Mansion. And it was not called the White House at this time. Uh, on his second evening in its damp, unfinished rooms, he wrote to his wife, quote, Before I end my letter, I pray heaven to bestow the be best of blessings on this house and all that shall hereafter inhabit it. May none but honest and wise men ever rule under this roof, unquote. Adams lost the election of 1800 and the Democratic Republicans lost control of Congress. And that's discussed in more detail in a subsequent video. After the election and before the new president, Thomas Jefferson, and the new Congress were sworn in, however, the outgoing lame duck Federalist Congress pulled a stunt. They, they passed the Judicial Act of 1801. You can see it on the right here. The law sought to reorganize the federal judiciary by reducing the number of Supreme Court justices from six to five when the next justice retired. They, they just wouldn't refill it. But it also, however, greatly expanded the number of federal district and federal circuit courts. They were, they were called circuit because it was common for judges to, quote unquote, ride the circuit, moving trials around from town to town. Anyway, this expansion of the lower federal courts meant that the John Adams could appoint, 
and Congress could approve a whole new wave of lifetime justices, federal judges, before the new government was inaugurated. The last-minute legislation, uh, Judiciary Act of 1801, was clearly partisan, allowing the Federalists to appoint justices that would enhance the federal government's power and authority. And the, uh, the, the, you know, the incoming Democratic Republicans wouldn't be able to remove them. Adams spent his last day before Jefferson's inauguration appointing the so-called Midnight Justices. He appointed 42 on his last day in office. The appointments predictably outraged the incoming Jefferson and Democratic Republicans and led to a new political fight early in Jefferson's term. After appointing the Midnight just Justices, uh, you know, Adams returned to his home in, in Massachusetts, known as Peacefield, and you can see it here. And there he lived for another 26 years. He and Jefferson had once been very close revolutionary associates, but their political differences had strained their relationship, not surprisingly, and only late in life did they rekindle their friendship, as again, I noted in a, I will note in a, a subsequent video. In any event, this concludes the video on the one-term presidency of uh, John Adams, and we'll talk about the election of 1800 in the uh, subsequent video.